Hello and welcome to the Be Glad movement. My name's Pollyanna and I'm on a mission to bring you as many stories as possible of good coming out of bad and reasons to be glad. And today I'm joined by Philip. Say hello, Philip. Hi, Polly. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. You've got um, you've got a, a story which is I'm I'm really grateful for you sharing this because it's a tough story and uh, I'm just going to sort of get out of your way and, and let you share that with us. So um, you dive straight in. It it is well. I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you how I came to telling my story first of all, and then then I'll go into the story. Um, the ex BBC uh, news presenter Maxine Mawinney contacted me and said, um, you know, she was bored with her retirement and had started a new TV show which she called The Moment. Um, that's a YouTube TV show, and she's interviewing people for 15 minutes. And she said, "Look, I'd really like to interview you." Um, uh, so I, I emailed her and said, you know, "What subject do you want me to talk about?" She said, "Oh, that's up to you. It's the moment. You just tell me a moment that's affected your life, um, and uh, we'll talk about that." And there was only one moment, and that um, went back to uh, a time in Iraq, whenever um, I put a pistol to the side of my head. Um, in uh, December 2005 and was squeezing the trigger and got to a microsecond from it going bang. And then all of a sudden, this vision of my dad came into my mind and you know, I, I, I then looked around at the wall behind me and thought, that is going to leave a terrible mess. I don't want any of my soldiers clearing that up. Sure. But at the moment I got to where the pistol was there, I had just this complete and utter sense of calm. All the crap that had been going on beforehand, all the stress that I was under had gone in that, that, that moment. Um, and it's really, really scary. Mm. Um, and it's after the vision of my dad and looking around at the wall, I took the pistol away from the side of my head. I unloaded it. Um, uh, cleaned it, um, and then went off to uh, off to bed for the night at uh, just after midnight. Uh, I was I was working from six in the morning to after midnight, uh, six and a half seven days a week um, for for the time there. So a, a horrible tour, horrible Great. horrible tour. Sure, sure. Well, imagine. Yeah. And that was your moment, and and you were willing to to share it. Um, that's quite a big thing. Tell tell me more about that. It is well the the the, the moment itself. I think you know that's reflected. Um, you know a lot of a lot of pressure was going on before before I went to Iraq. I was a senior officer. I was at that stage. I was a lieutenant colonel. I was commanding my battalion. Um, it was an intelligence battalion. This was the first time we were deploying um, a, a, a structure into um, supporting operations in in Iraq. I'd done an awful lot of operations beforehand. You know, I've, I've been in every Balkans operation um, that there's been at, at the beginning. Um, I've um, been to Northern Ireland, I've been to Cyprus, I've uh, traveled all, all, all over the world, tw uh, 26 years in the military. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, my career had been progressing well. But just before I went to Iraq um, uh, uh, this time, it was um, the summer 2005, my marriage was beginning to fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you get to that you get to that point, and it, I think it's been falling apart for years. Um, uh, and you've got a lot of personal stresses that are going on, but sure. you then get to the point where you've been warned to take your battalion to uh, on operations to Iraq, and you're in a preparation mode for that. And you and you switch in, and you've got you know, in, the, in in the military you, you've almost got sort of two personas. You've got your personal persona and what's going on. Um, in your personal life and all the rest of it, and you've got this front that you put on, like, it's like, like an actor on the stage. You once you've got the uniform on, you've got your rank on. You're in a position. Um, you, you're an alpha character anyway, so you're playing a role, and, and you play it to the best of your ability. Um, and you know, I got to the stage where I'd, I'd tried to park my personal problems, and I remember saying to my then wife, um, "We'll deal with this whenever I get back. I have to take the battalion to Iraq." Um, and the preparation then went on for getting us out there. Um, she continued to fight me and attack me and, uh, and all the rest of it, as, as happens in, in these messy situations. But um, I, I then went to Iraq um, uh, as, as part of the reconnaissance with the new divisional commander that was going out and all the rest of it, because uh, I was part of his senior command team. And my second day there, uh, I remember flying um, into the Italian 
uh, battalion's headquarters um, and we're coming in in a Chinook helicopter and there was just three of us in the back of the Chinook helicopter, the general, his chief of staff and myself. And we were coming into land and I remember the, seeing the sand um, be, be, being blasted up, feeling the heat coming from the engines that's, uh, that's coming in, feeling fairly relaxed, looking forward to finding out what uh, the Italians were doing, feeling uh, a little bit uh, chilled because I was away from the personal problems at home. It was a few Aww. days off from it. And then all of a sudden this shiver went down the back of my spine and, and, and I just got this feeling I had to phone back to the headquarters in Basra um, where Multinational Division Southeast was based. And I don't know what it was. I, it just this, this just hit me. And as I got off the helicopter, I, I motioned the general and said, look, I have to go make a phone call. Um, please excuse me. Um, uh, and I, I got a glaring look from his chief of staff. But I went off to, to phone back, phone back to the guy that I was taking over from. And I yeah, said, Andy, I don't know why I've got this urge to call you. Um, but I have. What's happened? And his first words to me were, Phil, I can't tell you. And I then thought, right, there's something that's happened. They said, look, I've, I've, I've walked out of a, a briefing with the general because I've had this feeling to call. I need to explain what's going on. Explain to me what's happened. And he explained that, um, after a little bit of persuasion, explained that there'd been a, an attack on a convoy coming out of Basra. An improvised explosive device had gone off, um, had uh, blown one of the snatch Land Rovers apart, um, killed one individual, severely wounded three others. The individual that killed was a guy called Major Matt Bacon. Matt was my old company second in command. He was a personal friend. Um, he was going to be my uh, uh, one of my staff officers running um, human intelligence operations whilst I was out there, and I was looking forward to working from or working with him again. Mm. And um, uh, he one of the reasons why I was coming out um, in a vehicle was the helicopter had broken down to to fly him out. Um, and he was coming out to see me and do other things. And oh, one of the soldiers that was um, uh, severely injured was from my battalion in Germany. And three of the other soldiers were infantry soldiers attached to uh, protecting the, the human intelligence operations that we, we had running there. So day two, my introduction to Iraq before it actually formally deployed was a friend of mine getting, uh, getting killed. Oh. Um, so that was horrible. Day three, I was down in the hospital. Um, and you know, with um, uh, my young corporal who had who was unconscious and, and been kept unconscious to try and keep him alive, um, and the three young infantry soldiers who'd all lost limbs, um, and they were um, all conscious and you know sitting down there, and they saw me as a lieutenant colonel, a commanding officer, coming in to talk, and I, I, just, I just sat and talked to them for um, a, a couple of hours, not really knowing what to do, and their only concern was. You know, would this put an end to their soldiering careers? They just wanted to carry on being soldiers. And it was very humbling talking to them. Um, and then we continued the recce, and I flew back to Germany. Um, there was a big funeral for Matt. Um, had to deal with that, dealing with more um, personal problems before then, early in December, um, uh, flying out to um, do my six months there. And when I arrived... Um, it's the first operational tour I've arrived on where I've been physically and emotionally exhausted as I've landed. Um, right. and it was you know, a particularly hard start to, to, to that, that tour. Goodness me, yeah, that sounds absolutely horrific. Absolutely horrific. I just the, the amount that you guys have to put up with and, and deal with is phenomenal, it really is. So. Well, it, you know, it, it went from bad to worse. Five days after I arrived there, I got a phone call from my um, uh, battalion second in command who was left back in Germany with the rear party. Uh, and he said, oh, do you realize that your house has just been cleared out? Um, so my then wife, now ex-wife, um, uh, had cleared the married quarter out and uh, I'm taking it. And you know, he said, oh, do you want us to clean it up and, and hand it over? And I went, no, I, want, I need somewhere to live when I get back. Oh, um, my goodness. He said, I can't deal with this now. Um, uh, and you know, that that led up to you know, that 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 was December. So that led up to Christmas. So you know, that was part of the the trigger that I think took me to that point where um, you know, there was all I felt completely helpless. Of uh, the other thing that there was with that was we would just um, done the planning for the arrest operations to go and arrest the teams that had carried out the attack on Matt Bacon's convoy. Right. Uh, and 
when we analyzed all the information and intelligence that we had, um, we didn't need to get any new intelligence. We just need to put it together with that 2020 hindsight and you know, all the information that was there as to who these people were, the fact they were planning attacks in the area uh, and everything else. And the rest operation went in on no new intelligence. And I'd had a chance then to look at all of the tool sets that we had to do the job. And I, I, we didn't have the tools there to allow me to do the job that I knew that we could do. Tools that had existed in Northern Ireland 20 years beforehand. We, we didn't have these basic tools and operations. Oh my and, goodness. And, and people were dying because of it. Um, during the tour that I was there, I was there until uh, May. Um, during the tour that I was there, um, we lost 13 people, including one helicopter getting shot down. And every time we lost someone, you know, I took it as an intelligence failure. So I'd personally go in and go through all of the information that we had, try and find out all the warnings we put out, all the reports we put out, um, and, and trying to work out what we'd missed, what we'd done wrong, why these people had got into a dangerous situation, um, and, and we hadn't been able to predict it beforehand. And I, I was putting an awful lot of personal stress on, on myself to do that. Sure. Um, which, you know, the, these, these things happen, but I, I didn't want anything that we'd failed to do to have caused you know, the death or injury of, of people that were out there. Of I felt course. hugely responsible for it. That's a massive emotional burden as well for you. It, yeah. it, it is. And, and there's other things that are there. You know, the, um, as part of the intelligence picture, we've got all the coroner's reports for everyone that died. And they're, the graphic detail in them is, is horrible. Um, and again, I wouldn't let any of my soldiers have the responsibility for reading those. I thought, no, that's, that's, that's my job. Um, you know, to try and pull out the bits of um, information and intelligence that, that there was there, and there was there was some quite valuable intelligence in it, because um, it's all putting you know, li little bits of a jigsaw puzzle together to create the, the bigger picture. Right. And so, so that's very important. So, it was a, a stressful tour is an understatement. Sure. Um, um, and then you know, I got back from that um, in the May. Um, my uh, now ex-wife had. Um, uh, put complaints in about me uh, and my behaviour, which the army then goes into automatic investigation process. So the day I get back to Germany, um, having been delayed for 48 hours, courtesy of um, uh, aircraft breaking down on the way back, okay. which happens to a lot of people, I was in front of um, my boss in Germany uh, uh, for a, uh, an interview to um, uh, start an investigation to see if any of my behaviour had been inappropriate. Um, and uh, I broke down in that, in that interview completely. And right. he formally reported um, that at the end of it, that, um, he, uh, and I went off to the, the personnel division to say that he was concerned about the welfare and well being of, of this officer, and then did nothing about it. Oh, gosh. Absolutely nothing about it. Um, he continued his investigation. I couldn't go on my post operational tour leave until uh, that had come back because the stress that was there. His investigation found nothing, and I was completely cleared of any inappropriate behaviour. It was just an accusation from you know, an, an angry wife, now ex wife, um, mm. that was coming in, but, but adding, adding to the stress. Um, yeah, continuing on from that, um, you know, I, I was starting, I, I then went on a, a holiday starting to get back to normality again, starting to uh, you know, continue the relationship with my children who were at boarding school, but as, as a relationship breaking apart, you know, and, and beginning to build that. Um, and then um, uh, at the end of August, I was due to be taking them to back to their boarding school. I got a phone call um, from my ex-wife saying, look, can I take them to school and you can have them the next weekend? And in the interest of being... Um, uh, cooperative I said yes n not a problem you know I'll, I'll do that um, and that was the last I saw of them for 14 months oh my goodness um, because she didn't take them to school she um, took them to I didn't know where at that stage with um, her new partner um, oh, okay. um, so it took me 14 months to uh, to try and find them um, uh, and uh, you, know, you, you get one bit of stress on top of another bit of stress on top of another bit of stress and I then fell into um, a stress-induced depression. Right. And, and anyone who's suffered de a depressive illness, it's absolutely horrible. You don't realise you've got it yourself. That's 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 one of the problems. You just you just you 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 just feel life life's on top of you, but you, you still think you can cope when in reality you're not coping. Uh -huh. um, and it took me 
um, quite a while before I would go to my GP um, and, and say I've, I've, got, I've got problems and then get referred by my GP to um, uh, the relevant uh, mental health consultant. Um, and part of the issue with that was he was a personal friend and, and trying to open up with this sort of thing to a personal friend, someone that you knew socially, again, okay. was, was quite difficult. And he was the only person that was there. Um, but, you know, a stress-induced depression is a strip medical condition. Um, it's caused by the serotonin levels in your brain being reduced to a level where you can't replicate it quickly enough. And it can be fixed very easily um, with drugs, you know, like, like a lot of medical conditions. Um, and, you know, I was on um, uh, antidepressant drugs for um, a, about three years. Um, but that allows the brain to um, uh, get its own serotonin regeneration capability back together again and um uh, uh and then you can come off it but what the depression was doing was masking um uh what i wasn't dealing with properly which were the traumas that had gone through in iraq that sure. um uh, that, that led to a, a, a late onset ptsd um, right. so you know getting out of the army in 2010 um uh, you know i uh, it was starting to get out into civilian life, um, thinking that I was coping with everything and actually looking back on it now that I have been through um, treatment and everything else, looking back, I was just in a complete destructive life cycle, you know, mainly with personal relationships and um, with um, alcohol. Right. You know, I, I was running away from everything the whole time. Um, and yeah, as soon as I'd get into a relationship, as soon as it was starting to... Um, uh, stabilize and, and, and get good I'd be looking for the next one and running off and moving on and uh, you know, not turning up the things when I should be turning up um, uh, and it was horrible and that cycle went on from um, 2010 to 2014-15 uh -huh. um, when you know, 2014 my then girlfriend and now wife um, we had a huge bust up one night, absolutely huge bust up one night. Um, and you know, I, I, I left the house and we met up the next day and she said, this isn't right. And we had a long talk. And for the first time I realized that, um, you know, I could see that my behavior wasn't right in any way, shape or form. And I knew there was something wrong. And I, I then went off, um, you know, agreed to go and get treatment. Um, I looked around at the service charities and everything else and decided that the path I wanted to follow was in through my, my GP. I uh -huh. went to see my GP, explained what had happened and what was going on. Um, and my GP put me forward to the, the local uh, Dudley NHS uh, mental health unit where I was assessed. Um, and after the assessment, they said, yes, you're eligible for treatment. Um, and in NHS terms, I got it relatively quickly. Um, and um, you get funded initially for, I think it's 13 sessions of, um, uh, of treatment. The, the fourth session um, that I was in, my uh, counselor turned around to me and said, so when were you diagnosed with PTSD? And I went, well, I've never been diagnosed with it. You're, you're the first person to use that. I, I, I just know that I'm not right. And, and she said, oh, you've got PTSD. And could, then began to explain how, the, how she came to the diagnosis, what it was, uh, how we were going to deal with it and, and, and everything else. Um, the 13 sessions turned into 43 sessions before she would discharge me. Um, so I was in treatment for over a year. Um, and you know, the treatment uh, was absolutely superb. I don't know whether I was lucky because I got a fantastic counsellor. I don't know whether I was lucky because we, we uh, our personalities... Um, worked well in the way she could um, deal with me to help me understand what the, what the issues were and deal with the issues. But um, it got me through to a point where, you know, I can say uh, and I can feel that I'd, I'd got proper Philip back again. Right. Um, I couldn't remember the last time I, I, I knew proper Philip, so it's probably a different proper Philip to it was beforehand, but I, I, I got proper Philip back again. Wonderful. Um, that's really interesting that um, I'm, I'm interested that you mentioned that you went through your GP and, and found the treatment that way because I know a lot of 
guys and girls are coming out and they're looking at the charities and there's so many different charities it can be quite confusing who can help with what um yeah. so that's quite interesting because i think you're probably the first person that and, and, and it was worrying as well that the that commanding officer that you you opened up to and was worried about you nothing happened that's scary really? yeah i yeah because i've got to a, a pretty senior level um uh, and before I opened up to Maximo Winnie, I thought I have to highlight this as a problem. You know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd requested a copy of the interview notes um, uh, from the, that uh, brigadier's interview, uh, and and he went, "Oh no, you, you have to. We have to deal with this under the Freedom of Information Act." And and, and I thought, for God's sake, you know, just just tell me what's going on. And I thought there's there's something not quite right there. It took me um, six months to get a copy of the notes. Um, and when I got a copy of the notes, I realized what was in there. And, and uh, after I'd got diagnosed with the stress-induced depression, um, uh, you know, I realized that I wasn't being dealt with in the way that I, I would have expected to deal with it and had dealt with any, any of my soldiers. So I put a complaint in, um, a service complaint that I took right to the Army Board level. Um, and that took five years, six wow. years to work the complaint through. And it eventually got to the army board level where they said, yes, we're dreadfully sorry. We recognize that we hadn't dealt with you uh, properly, but we note that you went to see your GP um, the day after you got back from Iraq um, and said you couldn't sleep and your GP hadn't identified that you got any mental health issues. And therefore, um, we think that uh, our, our responsibility from a medical uh, perspective had been covered completely. So thank you very much. And bye bye. Wow. Um, and, then, and, then, and then went to Veterans UK and said, um, okay, you know, I've, got a, I've got an injury, like a physical injury, uh, it's just a mental injury. Um, you do, you know, can I apply for a, 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 an injury-based pension or, 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 or payout or something? So I fill the forms in, mm -hmm. sent me, send the forms back, and um, they go, ah, right, um, you haven't been diagnosed by someone at a consultant grade, either a consultant psychiatrist or a con consultant psychologist, which you'll never get to in the NHS unless you are very, very severely ill and, and, and worked in. And therefore, we don't recognize the diagnosis. Bye-bye. Um, so on the one hand, the Army Board was saying um, you, the GP didn't pick it up. And on the other hand, the uh, Veterans UK were saying uh, they didn't recognize the GP's diagnosis. They didn't recognize the NHS mental health um, uh, professionals who are treating you's diagnosis. It had to be with a, 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 a consultant. Um, you don't get to see a consultant. So unless you pay for it, uh, Veterans UK won't recognize it. Um, uh, and that's why guys and girls are falling down the cracks, I guess, yeah. and, and having additional stress yeah. that they don't yeah. need. Oh, the, 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 the falling through the cracks. And that, that, that then got me angry, and that's, that's good. Getting, getting me angry because um, it, it's, it, starts to, it starts me to focus on things. And you know, a lot of that had, had come to head and I'd, I'd, I'd finished treatment about um, six, seven months, eight months before um, uh, Maxima Winnie came and gave me that opportunity. And when I took that opportunity, um, a, a lot of people saw that and I got contacted by some of the national newspapers um, and I got a, a centre page spread in... Um, uh, one of the Sunday newspapers um, uh, the same weekend as the Royal Wedding. Um, uh, some newspaper, uh, some some radio shows contacted me and I did a big piece, you know, as, as people will be able to tell from my accent, I'm from Northern Ireland, uh -huh. um, uh, op openly admitting that I'm a, an ex-Army intelligence officer fr uh, from Northern Ireland to a Northern Ireland audience is another big step. But yeah. BBC Northern Ireland contacted me. Um, they were doing a piece on on stress and everything else. And asked me if I'd tell my story uh, to them, and I, I, I did. I did uh, to them and put it out. Uh, and I, I'm keeping that campaign going. Um, and I've done a piece with Johnson Press, who publish a lot of the regional newspapers, um, to try and get the story all, all, all around the UK. Because if, if I can signpost one person to get some help, yeah. or one person who is the partner of or the friend of someone that they're concerned about to get some help, to get them some help, or if I can educate one person a little bit more about understanding that you know, this is a condition that not everyone suffers from. You know, not every uh, ex-service person is coming out with a mental illness, um, with PTSD, uh, in the same way that not every uh, ex-service person who's 
been on an, on an operational tour will have killed someone, will have seen someone being killed, will have been injured physically themselves. So it's, it's a small minority. But for the minority of people who suffer from this, it's devastating, absolutely devastating. Yeah. Um, the, the, the second thing is it, it's treatable. You know, you, if you get help, um, then it can be dealt with and you can get proper you back. And a lot of people don't realize that. And the third thing is to let people know that the last person who realizes they're ill is the person who's suffering. I didn't realize I was ill until I had that huge bust up. Uh, and um, uh, my, my now wife turned around and, and, and you know, really pointed out to me quite hard, um, which, which got me to that point where I suddenly realized that, no, there, I, I wasn't right and, and had to be dealt with. Uh, and and I was going to say that's a battle that a lot of, of families are having to deal with is when, when the front line comes home with the guys and girls and they're having to, to watch their loved ones going through this mental turmoil and not really knowing how to, how to tell them because obviously you're still in denial, aren't you? You don't really think that there's anything wrong. So it's a, it's and, and you don't see there's a difference, but you know, the, 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 what you think are petty things at home um, having been in operations and dealing with all of that, you know, seem extremely petty to you, but they're very real to the person that you've left at home. It, it was interesting. I, re I remember sitting uh, at a dinner night um, at Chick Sands beside this fantastic um, Second World War veteran called Hilary Totchan. And Hilary um, had uh, fought in through Yugoslavia. He'd, he'd fought in um, uh, North Africa. Um, he'd then come up through... Uh, the invasion of Italy. Um, he'd been captured by the Germans twice and escaped from German prisoner of war camps twice and come back again. And he had a huge row of um, Second World War medals. And, and he then, from Italy, gone round and come in through D Day and Normandy and all the rest of it. And then, after that, went into um, Iraq in 1946 and set up the first combined intelligence center in Basra in Iraq. So, we, you know, uh, and this was before, before I I'd, I'd deployed um, out, out to the Middle East. And I was, I was talking to him about the stress of the Second World War. And um, he, he turned around to me and he said, well, I don't know how you guys do it. And I went, sorry, Harry, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, if you think about it from our perspective, you know, I was away for six, seven years um, with um, friends and colleagues and everyone's families ha were involved in this. So you know, the community back at home were aware of it. We didn't have the stresses of internet connection, mobile phone connection, been able, uh, been able, uh, the expectation of being able to communicate. You know, I'd write mm -hmm. a letter and possibly three, four weeks later, um, I might get something back. Maybe a month later, I might get something back. And he, he also said that um, when we were on operations and, and we were fighting, we'd have you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks of intense activity. And then we'd have two, three, four months of, of virtually nothing living in the local villages, just chilling and we're all together and, and therefore you know, we can debrief each other and, and, and get on before the next period of intense activity ah. and then you know, calm again. He said, you're not doing that. What happens when you go on operations? You, know, you, you spend six months of intense activity. You're not getting that you know, three or four weeks. Six months of intense activity and then you come back and you're back into training and preparing again to go out on the next one and the next one and you do that through your whole career. He says, I don't know how you guys do that and you've got the pressure then of at the same time of communications back home and it being expected um, yeah. that, that that happens and that in itself brings another layer of stress and pressure on that um, didn't exist you know, during the during the second world war and, and the horrors of there and I, 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 I thought about that and I thought about that several times and it's yeah I, I hadn't actually looked at things from his perspective until, until he'd, he'd mentioned it that's um, really interesting. A lot of other people don't recognise that there is this modern world stress that comes on top of everything um, that um, helps um, you know, take bad things and make them worse um, uh -huh. and causes, again, more difficulties whenever you come back because um, it, it's very difficult to equate to normality. And um, uh, most people come back from operations and have a, a, an adjustment time and a lot of people will say they have difficulties during that adjustment time, and a very small number of people um, you know, have have uh, you know, suffer some form of anxiety 
or PTSD or some other form of illness. It is, it is a small number. Uh, and I think society uh, and, and the military charities and coming on to them um, have uh, a misunderstanding of that. You know, the military charities and certainly some of the smaller ones need to raise funds to keep themselves going. Mm -hmm. um, to raise funds, they need a marketing angle. And for a period of time, the marketing angle that was out there was the phrase PTSD. Um, oh. uh, because you yell PTSD and people dip their hands in their pocket and you're looking after service personnel and donate money. That's what the charities needed. So I think there was, um, for a period of time, uh, a number of people coming out and, and trying to vocalize that everyone was suffering too much. And it's not, it's a, it's a small number. Okay. Um, and then some um, ex-service personnel who w weren't adjusting properly, I think, um, felt that they almost had to wear PTSD as a badge of honor and, and say, I, I remember going through one resettlement um, course, um, which I was helping to mentor, and every single individual on that resettlement course turned around and said they've got PTSD. Okay. Only one or two of them had actually been formally diagnosed. And it's, 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 you know, it, it, it is not something you can self-diagnose. You, you can look at it and think, I'm not quite right, but mm. there's very specific circumstances and to get it properly diagnosed and leads to very specific treatments. And I think the whole, um, uh, and that, that's no fault of any individual and it's no fault of the charities doing this. I think it's a fault of um, you educating the wider community and, and the, the veterans community um, and, and therefore uh, all the supporters in, in the civilian world you know, about what the reality is. Um, and the NOD, I think, has, has let society down by not doing that. They're, they're starting to change it. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think that's the big thing. You, I think these guys and girls that are leaving the military actually should be assessed properly. But, you know, I don't think they should just be allowed to be sent off into the wilderness that is Civvy Street. They need um, some... I think that they need the community around them, and there's amazing breakfast clubs and things like that where they can um, re, um, reconnect with their military buddies. Um, but I also think that they should personally it's my own personal opinion there should still be some contact they i feel like the um the military should be keeping an eye on on people that leave to a degree you know following up and making sure everyone's okay that i think it's a duty of care because when you go into the military you are transformed like you say you you you're given this uniform which is your your mask and your armor literally as well but it, it you know metaphorically um and then you're, you're trained to be a different type of person and, and then you have to just go back to being an average Joe and it's not that easy to, to transfer back to being an average Joe, you know. Yeah, it's not. And any employer that, you, you have, there are no other employers out there that um, force you to go into uh, areas where you are, will get the same sort of level of physical danger. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we saw um, uh, yesterday in Westminster um, the uh, uh, alleged terror attack of the guy driving the, the vehicle into the into the um, the barrier, and we saw the police officers, the armed police officers, running at it. They didn't know whether that car was going to go boom. That's the closest to civilian street that you get to what the military do, where you know we we, we go running towards danger um, because we have to deal with it. Um, and I think the Minister of Defence then goes, well, once, once you're a veteran, we've dealt with that. The NHS is free, so we're different to any of the other countries around the world, and, and you'll get picked up and, and dealt with that. Oh, and we've got, we've got service charities. Well, I think my personal opinion is I, I think it's absolutely disgusting that um, veterans have to rely on charities and charitable money yeah. to um, fix those again relatively small number of, of, of broken veterans or veterans who need help um, but but it's it's charitable money and I, I I don't like seeing service serving service personnel in uniform collecting for charities the charities love it because they, they, they think it's great but I see it as a service person begging for someone to give them money to look after them if they get ill and need it once they've left Mm. Uh, I don't I think that's wrong. And I brought this out um, again because it was senior level. I've, I've, I've started going noisy on it, so I'm going to keep the noise going. Okay. I brought this out with um, Chief of Defence People, um, Lieutenant General Richard Nuji, last week because um, I got hold of him on Twitter. I know him from old. Um, and I said, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence around there saying that all of the studies that you're quoting and everything else are wrong. 
Um, and the, with all of the comments that I'm getting in from people, uh, you know, I, I have to believe that um, they're wrong as well. Um, I've got quite a good audience out there. Meet me, talk to me, tell me what's going on, um, and let's see if I can help in any way in, in um, uh, getting your, your uh, approach to dealing with uh, veterans' mental health issues and veterans' welfare generally, um, and, and families of veterans as well, uh, get it, getting that done. So uh, give him his due, he did. I went down to see him and his senior team, and he gave me over an hour of his time um, in the Ministry of Defence headquarters in London last week. Um, and you know, he started off by saying, um, we're starting to do this study into numbers. And I thought, well, starting, we've withdrawn formally from Afghanistan and Iraq. We've got very small numbers of troops there. Do you not think it's a little late to start? And he, he went, well, yes, but I can't comment on what my predecessors did or didn't do. We have to start somewhere. So there's, 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 a, there's a very important study starting. Um, and part of that is data collecting. And they're collecting the data using um, veterans' um, national uh, insurance numbers and national health numbers as they're going through. But that means veterans have to have signposted themselves into the um, either uh, into the coroner's courts because they've committed suicide, mm -hmm. um, or into um, their GPs or the t or, or the military charities to to get treated. Um, uh, otherwise, they won't be picked up as a statistic. So one of the messages that comes out of that is if, if, if you are a veteran and you feel as if you're suffering, please talk to someone um, so that you're actually recorded and will become a statistic on that. Um, one of the areas that they're trying to signpost people to go through is through the Veterans Gateway. Um, and if you just Google Veterans Gateway, you can get in there. Um, I, I don't think it's particularly good myself, but it's a start. Uh, but again, if they don't get the right statistics, then they're going to be quoting the wrong stuff in the future and they're going to be going to think there's not a problem, there's going to be no investment, and it's the veterans that are, that are, that are going to continue to suffer. Um, but you know, they don't feel as if they've got the same sort of duty of care that I think that they should have. And I don't know how we're going to bring that together. Um, but I'm now a journalist reporting on intelligence, security, defence uh, matters and all the rest of it. Um, I've got a fairly good network of other journalists. I've put myself out around the place, uh, so I'm going to keep going noisy. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. I, I, um, I think I'm right in thinking, I saw a petition the other day, that it's actually not um, a requirement of the coroners to write whether someone that's committed suicide was a veteran or not yet. So, yeah. uh, but to me, it seems like an obvious thing that it should be recorded, really. And the fact that there's a petition going around to try and get it um, recorded is just someone, someone up there tell them to start recording it, you know. Because um, if we don't have these statistics, then how can we make actions in the future to, to remedy this, you know? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not just that. The, the only um, part of the UK that... Um, has its medical authorities uh, and therefore the GPs to try and identify veterans and formally record in the notes that they're veterans um, uh, so they can statistically gather the illnesses and all that is NHS Scotland. Okay. It has never been in anywhere else in the UK. It has just been brought in to England and Wales. I'm not sure about Northern Ireland um, because there are wider security <laughs> implications um, in, in Northern Ireland. But um, it's just been brought in England and Wales. So GPs should now be routinely asking when someone turns up, um, uh, asking whether they're, they're a veteran, so that whether it's a, 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 a joint injury, whether it's um, uh, uh, co caused by running, whether it's a, a, a mental health injury, whether it's something else, those statistics can then be gathered um, if Minister of Defence funds studies to, to go and look at them. But if the system doesn't know about people, then they're not going to become a statistic. And as I said to General Nugia said, um, he has to recognize that the statistics that he'll get in will just be the very tip of the top of the iceberg. Sure. And there's going to be an awful lot more underneath because you know, one of the symptoms of suffering, certainly a mental health illness, is you, know, you as the individual don't know you're doing it. If you don't know you're doing it, you're not going to signpost yourself into uh, seek treatment and all the rest of it. And there's a large proportion of people out there who, who are suffering. Um, and their families are suffering as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I've got friends that um, that are suffering, and the families are suffering. So yeah. it's um, it's a subject close to my heart as well. And uh, I'm so glad that you are heading up 
this um you get noisy as you put it about it because i really feel like it is something that needs needs to be um needs to be hammered home and like you say it's i i also feel it's not fair that um people having to rely on the charities i feel like the MOD should be looking after after personnel and veterans you know um, and, and again, you know, the, the, the NHS, the NHS is brilliant. You know, they, they looked after me, they looked after me extremely well. But um, as, as a percentage of the overall population, you know, veterans are a very small percentage of the overall population. You know, the issues that the NHS are having to deal with are so much more than um, uh, you, you, you get through all the normal civilian um, treatments that they have to deal with. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you get with veterans are, are very complicated um, and caused by a unique set of circumstances that no matter how many briefings you do or anything else, you're never going to be able to train the average NHS practitioner, whether it be a GP, whether it be a consultant, whether it be um, a, a therapist, uh, the, 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 the nuances and, and the pressures that people are going under um, whenever they're at military operations. And, and therefore, you, the over-reliance on... Uh, on, on the NHS and the over-reliance on the charities who you know, are not bringing ex-military people in to do their, 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 their therapy. They're bringing in other civilian practitioners. It, it's, it's very, very difficult. And, and I do think that the Ministry of Defence needs to sit up and recognise this. And they're starting to do it. I, I got the impression from General Nuji that him and his team are, are aware of it. And they're trying to balance off um, what they feel uh, they should be doing with what they feel they have to do, uh, with what the Ministry of Defence thinks is uh, their responsibility and has been passed on to someone else. And it's, it's a very difficult balance. But that's at a very, very high level. And whilst they're working on that dilemma that's going on, you know, day to day, anecdotally, we're hearing of um, veterans committing suicide, um, families are breaking up, um, you know, it's affecting children, it's affecting um, uh, parents, it's affecting grandparents, it's, you know, it, it, it's not good and there, that level of support needs to be there somewhere. Um, yeah. And I've, you, we're trying to signpost people to the Veterans Gateway. Uh, I've, I've looked at it, it's supposed to be there for families as well um, and therefore it's, it's worth people trying it and if it doesn't work, yell because you know, I'll fit it back into the top and say, um, this is not working. You know, here's your know, X number of um, notes that I've had saying it's not working. You know, can you do something about it? Awesome. And we'll share your um, your Twitter feeds and all that kind of thing at the end of, of the video so that people can yeah. um, connect and follow you and follow your progress because I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people that are going to be really interested in, in supporting you with this. It, it, it's an important message to get out. Um, and as, as I said at the beginning, it's, if, if it can help one person either understand a little bit more or seek treatment or realise that the behaviour of, the, of, the, of their loved one is not proper them, it's not what they've turned into and it can be cured. Or it, it can be treated. Cure, I think, is probably the wrong word, but it can yeah. be treated. Is, is, is really, really important. Um, yeah. Uh, because it, it, it can be. Um, and and it, that, that difference between cure and, and, and treatment, uh, I think, is quite important. Um, uh, I don't think you can ever be completely cured of it, but you can recognise the symptoms of whenever you're falling back into that very dark place again, uh, and, and you can seek help, or you know that you can get through it, uh, and therefore it's, it's not quite as bad. Um, you know, I, I've uh, had almost 10 years of suffering, um, and therefore I know the, 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 the dark, dark places you can get to. Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I really do feel that this is going to help a lot of people to hear your story, but also um, the, the hope with uh, what you've just mentioned about, you know, being noisy, taking this to the top and hopefully getting some, um, some results mm. for people so that they're, they're not left to fall down the cracks like they are at the moment. Yeah. So really valuable. Yeah. My, 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 my pleasure and, and, and good to meet you and, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story. Thank you so much. I'll just round up the, uh, the video. If you like this video, then please do hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, you can follow the Be Glad Movement on Facebook, uh, Twitter and Instagram. If you search at Be Glad Movement, um, you'll be able to find us. And please do get in touch if you've got a story to share, even if it's something very similar to something that someone else has shared, because I really do believe that your story and your voice is going to reach 
at least one person, probably more that you'll never even know about, and you will be able to help them by sharing your story. So please do get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to seeing you in another episode. Many thanks.